test. It's a little bit different than the usual talk. Summer talk is always good to try out these things. So uh, this talk is really about uh, something uh, kind of putting things into more uh, perspective. So it's a combination of research that we have done over the last uh, five or six years or so. And I combine it with insights into, let's say, political, social aspects. And um, so the technology that we are creating has a, a very a tight connection to society, in fact, and increasingly so. And I'm arguing in this talk uh, that we need to be careful what we're doing because, uh, you know, Cambridge Analytica, and we are messing up the world, and we have to take care of what we're doing. So this talk is trying to put things into perspectives. Possibly some things are maybe a little bit provocative or thought-provoking, I hope at least for you, uh, but that's the whole purpose of, of, of this talk, so that it gets you thinking. So um, get started with basically some observations. So what we are uh, seeing in the last decade or more or so is that we are combining <laughs> systems with components of people, services, and things. That, that reads very trivial. Um, but if you think about it, in the past we were mainly focused on services in the sense of software in general. People were outside the system, interacting with the system, and things were never thought of actually becoming part of the system. Now, what we are seeing now is that we have to build and we are actually in the process of creating systems which are in different domains, smart homes, health networks, governmental systems, transportation, energy networks, etc., which have these different building blocks inside the information system that we are creating. And this, of course, creates a lot of issues because all the programming paradigms that we have, all that the uh, metaphors that we have, the analogies, how to think about a system like this, they don't apply. Simply, they don't apply. We are not sure how to do it. We have an intuition that everything is connected with each other, similar to our own human body. We have the autonomous, uh, autonomic nervous system where in our own body we have the manifestation of what is going on. We have all the organs, we have the spine, everything is connected by a network of networks. So there is a lot of communication going on. There are thresholds when things go wrong. It, it manifests itself in some kind of form. You, have, you, you become sick, etc. And isn't it the fact that we are kind of mimicking this exactly what in the IT infrastructure? So what we are doing de facto the last uh, four or five decades is we are replicating the human body uh, into technology. So what we are creating, <coughs> what we are creating is sense essentially trying to mimic this and with the uh, you know emergence of internet of things the sensor world etc we are actually adding similar uh, the, to the, the eyes and ears and noses and, and etc to, to the system but if you observe you will you will notice that these eyes and ears and you know the sensory information is pretty much not connected to the rest so where is the connection to the business processes? Where is the connection to the business models, uh, et cetera, et cetera? So I think a good analogy for us is to think in ecosystems. So when we are creating, and we are the creators of these technologies, when we create the systems, it's good to look into ecosystems. I think this is the best analogy that we have, an ecosystem which is composed of these three building blocks. And if we take some, uh, you know, information from nature, we, let's have a look at this marine ecosystem. You have all this energy from, from the sun, you have the birds, you have the rocks, you have the water, and the animals, etc. If you observe, everything is connected with each other here, right? And if things go wrong, you know, there is some mechanism that is uh, kind of regulating this. This mechanism is not really visible in that sense. That's already quite, quite an interesting fact to observe. So the actual intelligence, if you like, is in these arrows, how the relationship between these building blocks is. And similarly, I'm arguing that we need to, if we want to build an ecosystem, and I think probably we all agree that when we create these systems of people, system, uh, people systems and things, that we have to create an ecosystem, really. And the ecosystem uh, characteristic is always that it is robust, it is resilient, even if things go wrong up to a certain degree. 
So it is trying to uh, have uh, stability even if there is some disruption. And it has measures of health. This means that the overall ecosystem is being monitored and measured so that it is overall <coughs> known when things go wrong. Both of, the, of these uh, attributes uh, would actually apply to our systems, but we do a very poor job in doing this. We are doing it, we are doing it in, in isolated uh, silos. And what I'm arguing here is that exactly this is the problem. So the yellow arrows is, is, is the challenge. And now when we uh, take an example of a smart city, the smart city in itself is a hype word, I agree. It's actually totally useless. But the good thing about the smart city is it focuses our attention to a, a certain domain, if you like. And that domain is kind of a geographical domain, but everything is included. So what I like about that term is that it has, it, it provides us with the necessary attention to not go vertical by vertical but rather have a, a few of uh, which is more holistic. So if you take a, a, an example of the smart city, you have the things perspective, like containers which are smart, sensors all over the place, you know, for water sense, uh, trash, uh, parking, etc. You have different types of software <coughs> uh, providing services for disaster management, for traffic control, etc. You have different people running around with the smartphones, the, the Fitbits, etc. Uh, all that data is created and provided, usually everything is provided as a service, right? So in theory, we have access to the necessary building blocks that we can utilize for creating such an ecosystem. So when we are going about to create such an ecosystem for a smart city, we look at all of these devices which are there, we kind of create an infrastructure of the IoT and the cloud uh, computing infrastructure, we create smart services on top of it and some manage services and build the overall IoT ecosystem. Now some of the problems are related to the fact that people think that IoT and cloud, uh, they, they always, everything has to go to the cloud. <coughs> Pretty wrong. So we were discussing with uh, Frank uh, the other day about Industry 4, right? Uh, which is also part, part of this agenda. Now, Industry 4 is, uh, as you know, is, is predominantly uh, geared towards the manufacturing uh, area. Um, so, Industry 4 is driven by the Japanese, uh, by, the, by, the, by the Germans mainly, so the Japanese thought, okay, Industry 4 is nice, but we can do better, so they started an initiative called uh, Society 5. So Society 5.0 is, of course, an upgrade to the Germans, uh, you know, uh, 4.0. And what they are arguing is basically they are saying, okay, we were a pretty, you know, primitive society in the past. We were a hunting society. We were, had a coexistence with nature, as if that is bad. But anyway, this is a pretty, you know, this was the situation. And we have moved agrarian society, industrial, etc. And now we want to be a super smart society. The society is always small. <laughs> exactly. To say, to say, actually call it super smart. Yeah, that's oh. what they call it. Because smart was not enough. <laughs> now I would like you to take a deep breath because now I'm kind of making a, a, a kind of a conceptual shift. Because I'm now trying to argue that there is something wrong with this picture. The German one is right. <laughs> <laughs> And what is wrong, I would like to put into perspective with a, a quote from uh, one of the engineer scientists I admire a lot, Tesla, the real Tesla, not Elon Musk. Yeah. <coughs> so he says, the scientists of today, they think deeply instead of clearly. One must be sane to think clearly, but one can think deeply and be quite insane. <laughs> So I, I ask you to, to ponder upon this quotation for a couple of seconds. It, reads, it looks very trivial, but actually there is a lot of depth into it. So what's the difference between deeply and clearly? Um, my interpretation of this is that we have kind of lost the plot, if we can say, 
that because we are focusing so deeply on each individual technologies, we are losing the overall perspective of seeing clearly. <coughs> so in the sense of, you know, not blur. And I think that we are at a point in time in our society and we are the creators of a majority part of the technologies of this society, we have to be careful what we are doing and we have to think clearly and not only deeply. And I think we probably all agree that we have a lot of examples of technologies who were created by thinking deeply but not thinking clearly in that perspective. And now I'm, I'm arguing basically for something which I think is uh, maybe very unusual for some of you. I'm actually questioning this linear perspective <coughs> of history. Um, you might wonder, okay, why, why would I do that? But it is necessary to do that because if you argue that everything was super primitive and now everything is becoming super smart, you have some problems with some artifacts that you find in the world. And I would like to challenge this with a, a kind of a quote with so-called ancient computers, right? So you all know of Stonehenge or of uh, so-called Adam's calendar in South Africa, which are essentially uh, computers. Why are they computers? They are just rocks, you might say, but they are computers because they say something about Earth must be perspective in the cosmos. So civilizations who built this must have a, a, a clear understanding of the relationship of us in the cosmos. So the, the kind of metaphor of having a, a, a super primitive society and now we are moving to a super smart society, I would argue breaks. So we actually had an intelligent or smart or smart society before, but they have disappeared. So I'm arguing what actually happened. And what I'm saying here is that we are at a similar point in time in our civilization where we have we are at the at the border of either becoming irrelevant and destroying ourselves. And technology plays, uh, plays a crucial role in this. That's why I'm giving this kind of strange type of talk combined with technology and Society. Okay, so one quotation to trigger your mind again purpose of education is to replace an empty mind with an open one. Quite amazing, isn't it? <laughs> and I think if we are honest to ourselves, are we, are we doing that at the universities, at all these institutions, or are we becoming dogmatic? Are we becoming like the priests? And we are doing the same like the old religions have done. Are we doing the same in science? And then, well, this is by Forbes, the founder of the Forbes magazine, which probably <laughs> doesn't even know that the founder did this uh, quotation. But there is another interesting quote from a scientist, again, which we all, I think, admire for looking into the stars. And he has a quotation which, uh, which uh, kind of amazed me as well. He said, Galileo, we cannot teach people anything, we can only help them discover it within themselves. So, let's ponder a little bit about this. So this, there is this one scientist who is obsessed about looking out, right? And he's saying that actually you should look within yourself. So what's the story, right? So, he seems to say that there is a lot in there already um, within ourselves. I think it is related to thinking clearly versus thinking deeply. Now let's put that in contrast to what we are doing in our current state of our civilization. So the three biggest fears of our generation are this. <laughs> you can all relate to this, right? Um, and I'm arguing that this is a fundamental problem. <laughs> Uh, because we are actually a fear-based society. Did you compare this with the three fears a thousand years ago? No, I did not. I leave that to you. It okay. Was, it was the same. <laughs> the, point Thank is, you. the point is that basically the implementation changes here, right? But the fear is the important aspect here. So 
I think that when we are in constant fear, we cannot innovate, we cannot create and become you know, a, a, a contributing society. So I'm looking for, okay, what actually is the core problem? And the core problem seems to be this. If you want to change the world, you have to change the metaphor. So what is our metaphor? So what do we do actually in our society? And if you observe carefully, we, we actually see that what we are told is that everything is in constant struggle and we are constantly repeating the fear factor everywhere we go. Where does this reflect? Well, this reflects in the relationship we have from science to technology because everything that we built somehow ends up as a security threat or as a weapon. And the problem is, what I'm arguing is that that is not really helpful to create innovative solutions in the context of smart cities. So there is a co-evolution of science and technologies, which is, I think, very clear. And if we want to create smarter cities, smarter societies, we have to actually create new abstractions which are useful for all society. How can we build these systems when we are still in the old metaphor? when we are concerned with things which are still in the old paradigm, if you like. <clears throat> so I'm saying that we have to move away, basically, and create new abstractions and models. And these new parts of the uh, models, these ecosystems that we have to create, they have to have something related to architecture, <coughs> to structure, and to dynamics. And in the remaining 10 minutes or so, I would like to uh, show you three simple paradigms which I think are important because this talk is not about, okay, I have technology X, Y, Z. This is about the, the paradigm uh, change that we have to have. So what I'm doing now is I'm basically saying what we need to focus on is to look into what actually is the glue of this, what we have to create. And the first thing, I think, is uh, the yellow arrows, you remember, in the ecosystem, which is, I think, something which is helpful for resilience, which is the property of elasticity, which comes from material science. And you know it's the, it's the uh, property of a material when it def deforms, when it, develops, <coughs> and it then goes back to it, right? Now, why is this so super interesting? We all know uh, elasticity from cloud computing. More or less, right? But I'm arguing to give it a slightly uh, different semantics. So typically, when you talk about uh, cloud computing, you, you think more in, in uh, or let's put it another way, we think in scalability typically. We have all been trained in building scalable systems, and essentially, this is always having the worst case in mind, which is actually pretty similar to the fear factor, but let's put that aside. So we have it in the worst case. But I'm arguing that actually elasticity could be seen as something more than just scalability. We could see that elasticity is something operating in a three-dimensional space where you operate with resources, you add and remove resources, and that resource can be a compute thing, but could also be people, right? So you want to dispatch a team of people to a certain place, that's also a resource. And if the problem is bigger, you want to deploy more people to a certain site, that's also a resource. But that's currently not really part of our paradigm. Right? <coughs> but it has to become. The second aspect is uh, the quality elasticity. So you basically say, OK, uh, if the, uh, the quality of the data which is coming in, the accuracy is bigger than or smaller than this, you know, make some decision. And the cost uh, elasticity. If, and then you have to combine it. So I'm arguing that all the systems in this space that we are creating now and in the decades to come, are operating in this three-dimensional space. And this is due to and enabled by cloud computing, essentially. Because it is the first time in history where the business model, the money aspect, was actually becoming a part of the software that we are creating. Before that, it was not the case. It was detached. So there is already one level of integration. So we are building systems having this in mind. So we have created a very simple language which actually creates elasticity primitives which are put into the code, if you like, and actually put into different levels of abstraction. So either attached to the cloud service, but also down to the program code level. So you can say, okay, you monitor some resource, um, and 
make some, define some constraints, and then have some strategy how what to do when you encounter this. And we have done that in one of the EU projects we had, which was a cloud computing project. But nevertheless, to just show you where the idea is going, that you had uh, services deployed on virtual machines, which are represented here by these puzzles. Uh, and then we had the civil code, which actually defines on different levels of abstraction elasticity properties. So for example, you'd say, OK, to, you define a constraint. If the response time is smaller than five milliseconds, the second constraint this. The number of users is, is, is more than this. We do a, a fulfillment of um, uh, constraint one, or you minimize the costs. And similarly, you can do on different levels of abstractions such things. And the system automatically deploys the services on those virtual machines which match those requirements for the elasticity the best. And these red dots are representing when things go wrong and didn't work out. Why is this important? Because essentially what you want to do is over time you want to have a look at your application and in this three-dimensional space, how does it evolve over time? Is it still in the boundaries or are you actually losing a lot of quality or you're having way too many too, too high costs? or you are using way too many resources, right? So the idea is that you can actually say something about this. So with this type of um, approach, our goal is to put emphasis not on the functionality necessarily, but on these yellow arrows in the ecosystem, right? Because this is the glue that's put, put holding together um, these different uh, parts of the application. The second paradigm is what I call uh, the social compute units. And the idea is essentially that people are part of the system. So there is a long tradition in, in, in uh, computer science that people are somehow part of the system, but they are actually just interacting with the system and not necessarily functional building blocks, if you like. So a number of years ago, we have started to question this. And uh, we, had, we started with uh, actually creating kind of web service interfaces for, human, for humans, right? We call that uh, human-based services. Um, and, and the idea is that we can actually do much better than we are doing now, right? So if we say, okay, I'm now Elon Musk and I come in and say, okay, we can have, we have 10 millions and if you create a project until tonight, I give you the money. And the problem is that we are unable to efficiently organize ourselves, the, the, the creative uh, output of ourselves, and put that into some structure. But I think that is absolutely necessary now because the people are part of the system and we need to have better decision-making tools, better tools for creative processes. How do we create teams? How do we form them? How do we dissolve them? How do we uh, delegate tasks to these people? How do we create and merge these teams? How do we dissolve these teams? All of these things, at the end, today, boil down to email and folders. I mean, really? Is that everything we could come up with to save the society? So, uh, Dropbox, I forgot, yes. <coughs> so, uh, so this doesn't work, apparently, right? So we need to have better abstractions. So we have created this notion of social compute units and combined that with elasticity. So the idea is basically to have different kind of algorithms, uh, optimizations, first come, first serve, real algorithm, whatever, basically to provide a mechanism which is able to provide the technology plus the people aspect at the time when it is needed. So for example, when I say, now we are creating this team automatically based on skills or previous trust relationships, that this system that we are creating, this middleware de facto at this point in time, is putting together the resources, putting the bundle of the technology that is needed, and providing that, for example, on the cloud, so that the people can collaborate don't waste uh, a couple of days or months or weeks on actually organizing themselves. I think this is also a necessary part. The third paradigm is what we call uh, osmotic computing, for the lack of a better term. But I think it sounds interesting. So the first was stolen from physics. This one is stolen from chemistry. Basically, the idea is from chemistry to recall that you have molecules and they diffuse from a higher to a lower concentration solution, right? So the idea is now we have the so-called edge devices. These edge devices are linked to the IoT world, but not necessarily only, but they are linked there. And there is a lot of software running on these edge devices, or actually there should run a lot of software on these edge devices. Currently, it's not really the case. 
and we have the uh, cloud computing infrastructure. But there is no idea currently um, how these software services should be moved back and forth. Currently, we are uh, developing software for the edge, and then we have to think about for which edge exactly, what is the you know what is the requirement, etc. Uh, and we have uh, services running on the cloud. But I think what, what I here is that we need to have mechanisms to have services which actually can be deployed uh, anywhere. It's kind of similar to the serverless argument, I, I could say, but the idea is that you know these services they move where they are needed. So that might be the edge, that might be the cloud, and I think that is necessary. In what way uh, you know we have to achieve, we have to see. But conceptually, first, if you want to change the world, change the metaphor. I think the metaphor here is the right one. And I think we also have a metaphor problem nowadays in the sense that perspectives when we look at the IoT, Edge, Cloud, etc. So what we see is that people are basically talking as if the cloud is the internet. For God's sake, this is not true, right? So we have to, again, have a, a better look at this, right? So I'm arguing basically for an internet-centric perspective. And the internet, the cloud-centric perspective, of course, as the name indicates, says that the cloud is the center of the universe, right? And you just deploy it, and everything is fine. Um, and it, it has a, a couple of conceptual problems as well, which are necessary for us to solve the bigger picture, namely in the context of the smart city. And that is basically better fixed with the internet-centric perspective. The internet-centric perspective basically says that the things belong to partition subsystems, and they can they can be organized differently, uh, and uh, you know you can have forms of autonomy, you can have regions of autonomy, you can have, for example, analytics at the edge side. You don't need to transport everything to the cloud, and the intelligence is the, the, the super smart society is in the cloud, right? So you can actually also have it at the edge side, and I think that is actually also necessary if we are mimicking the human body. Uh, we should do that because that is exactly what is happening also in our own bodies. And communications is expensive, so the case for, late, for, for edge is de facto the latency. And I think we have also a good representation in our own human bodies. We have the autonomic nervous system, we have different layers of architecture in our brain. We have the reptilian brain which has the fight, and fight, the fight or flight mode. And we have the intellectual cortex capabilities, right? We don't consciously, constantly think about how to breathe. That would be counterproductive for us humans. So, um, if we take a look at into the now, I'm coming to uh, to the next part. If I look into the smart city context, what we are advocating is basically to have a holistic view uh, of the smart city. So, what we would like to achieve is to create the necessary paradigms, metaphors, and technologies so that you can create basically a higher level of operating system for a smart city so that the, 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 the right ecosystem building blocks are there so that we don't start again on the same level of abstractions like with Java, with sensors and, and you know, all these things that we have done in the, in the last decades, but rather have enabling technologies which allow us to include the citizens to have complex processes, to have uh, empowered citizens which are informed, etc. And that is exactly what we are building and which uh, I would like to now uh, call Stefan to give the next part of the talk. So I hope that I could kind of present to you the, uh, you know, the, the, the necessary need for, for us to have a cyber-human collaboration so that we actually put these things together. So, uh, since I'm two minutes over time, I hand over to... Thank you so much. So, first of all, thank you for the nice... I'm starting the presentation already, so we save time. Can you give me the camera, maybe? I can tell you it works. It needs to be stolen. Very nice, yeah. Thank you for the nice introduction, Shantan, and also... You're welcome. For setting the bar so high now for me to give a presentation. you lose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there is no, yeah, I can't do, I can't do better. Than this, so.
It works. Cut. Works. Great. So, since I have about an hour, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Stefan Astich, and I'm a postdoctoral research assistant at the Distributed Systems Group, the DSG. Oh. It's that. Don't, yeah, don't breathe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so working basically with Professor Professor Schaffen Buskar and I'm also <coughs> co-founder and CEO of a reInvent company, which I'm going to introduce briefly. Uh, I earned my PhD in 2016 with the title Programming, Provisioning and Governing uh, IoT Cloud Systems. Uh, and basically during my uh, academic career, I published about, uh, I co-authored about 30 scientific uh, publications, one of which is the book uh, together with Professor Duskar on, on the smart cities. And recently I have uh, moved uh, more into the space of uh, smart cities, so working in this realm. And basically what I'm trying to do these days is to find a balance between the research and, uh, and the industry, kind of to, to bring these things uh, together. So about the, the company, the reInvent, it's a Vienna-based uh, or Theobin uh, spin-off uh, company, and it was uh, founded by a bunch of scientists, researchers, and software engineers uh, in, in Vienna. And we are mainly focusing on expert IT consulting, development, and innovation in green tech and smart city services. And of course, we need a mission statement, and our mission is to bring a new perspective and innovative solutions to your problems. In addition to this, we're actually developing a, a product, which I'm going to uh, briefly talk about today. Uh, so, just to summarize, kind of, um, a lot of things were said already by Professor Dostar about smart cities. And the question is, is it really uh, a hype? Is it only a hype word? Is it just a playground for a bunch of uh, guys, big players? Because these days we see that basically any use case is being either fitted or retrofitted to fit the smart city ecosystem. And there are so many business models which are uh, developed and which are being deployed basically uh, in, the, in the context of smart city. And similar to, to Professor Dostra, I'm also arguing that uh, smart city is actually far, it has a potential actually to go far beyond the playground and to become a natural ecosystem which can empower its inhabitants to basically create a value and shape their, uh, proactively shape their environment. And I think the mo one of the most important things about smart cities is that it has the, it offers the possibility to bring the value of unique in people. And now the, the question is, where does the technology fit in? And uh, I think it's very important to, to realize that um, in the context of smart cities, humans should, or people should be in the focus and the technology should be an enabler for the smart city in the sense we should really put it at the level of infrastructure, such as we have like uh, switch systems, as we have electricity systems, etc. Technology such as Internet of Things, cloud computing, and uh, also I think uh, blockchain uh, technology or distributed uh, ledger technologies should be really at the infrastructure layer of the, of the smart city. So uh, let's just briefly see now how do we stand currently, or how do the smart cities currently stand uh, with respect to the technology and uh, from the perspective of technology. And recently what's been happening, I don't know if you can see this, it's a bit blurry, but um, basically the, what's been happening is that the large technology players such as Google are entering the space of smart cities and they are really trying to push, uh, push their technology and to kind of conquer the smart cities. And we've been seeing that in Paris, we've been seeing that in uh, Toronto. Um, and as you can see, there is a lot of skepticism going on how this will basically pan out in, the, in this context. And I like this, um, this one actually. I like this one, the title from The Wired magazine is Why does the alphabet or Google want to build a, a city? And from their perspective, it's obviously to get more data. And again, we can come to the, to the problems of Cambridge Analytica, etc. So basically, from the technology point of view, smart cities are extensively being explored now for the sake of data, etc. But who knows what comes in the future. Now, if we look at the, another important aspect of the smart cities, which is enabling of the different business models, um, and basically the different economic models as well. And I think sharing economy is probably one of the most successful, if not one of the most important ones, which, which uh, uh, 
uh, rose from the, from the idea, which was enabled from the idea of smart cities. And I would just briefly like to discuss uh, probably one of the few biggest uh, players in this area, that's uh, Airbnb. And the question is that recently we've been seeing that um, Airbnb <coughs> is systematically, although we might all love Airbnb, uh, you know, I'm not arguing against the service, I'm arguing against the consequences of having such a service implemented as is at the moment. So what's happening uh, in different cities, such as, for example, the beautiful uh, Barcelona and the Berlin, since there are so many Germans here mentioned that as well. <laughs> uh, so what's happening is basically that there are uh, different neighborhoods which are uh, very popular, and if one goes and buys a house there, expecting that the price will, in the worst case, remain the same. But then you get a couple of people renting it out on the Airbnb because it's super lucrative. People earn money with that. And then what happens is it's completely unregulated and uncontrolled. You know, you get parties, you get the drug gatherings, you get even, I read, the, you know, shooting porn movies, etc. And then obviously these neighborhoods then deteriorate the value and they lose value. So basically people lose value. Uh, and the, the, the communities are literally getting destroyed by these uh, you know, enablers. And I really love this quote by Brian Chesky, which is the CEO of uh, Airbnb. It's, it's just a start. I don't think all cities hate us. Which is, so it's a good thing, you know, there are a couple of who don't hate us. Uh, anyway, and then, uh, you know, Another issue is that the prices go up then with the, with the, with the, of, the of the rents and people can't afford this, etc. So now the the question is: Is this only really uh, an issue which is linked to Airbnb, or are there more problems? And if we observe Uber, which is also a nice service, I, I and I use it regularly. Uh, just the, the problem with that is that it has also similar consequences, just in a different sector. So now it's not, we're not talking about housing sector; we're talking about transportation. But similar negative effects are presented by such things as well. And I think uh, this is um, again a very nice uh, kind of title to, to sum it all up, which is. Silicon Valley is ruining the sharing for everybody, implying that you know, the, the positive promise of sharing economy is really not delivering. Um, so after all, at the moment, smart cities are just the playground for big guys. And this, in this case, big guys are just the big companies who are sucking out the, the smart city values. And uh, basically, this is kind of a summary of the things which I uh, I think that the, the most important part here is that the right of decision is being taken away from those who are affected the most, which means basically somebody out there in California on the other side of the world is deciding on the fate of uh, your city, your community, your neighborhood. And how it is done is basically that the value of individuals and of communities literally sucked out. And by sucked out, I mean you know, literally transferred in a monetary sense from this community to some bigger company, which then brings it back uh, again to the, at least partially, maybe return something, or in, in some cases, uh, it's simply just sucking out the value. Uh, so yeah, since this is a scientific workshop, and I'm trying to combine this to the science, Course. And this is the failed promise of sharing economy. So just quickly, the sharing economy the concept is actually quite old. And basically, these are the, 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 the historical concepts of uh, sharing, borrowing, and exchange. And what the advances uh, <coughs> in ICT enable is simply to do this on a larger scale. So we could scale it up in, in numbers, we could geographically scale it up, and we could actually also scale the, the whole trust network far beyond the, the local village, for example, that was the case um, a couple of uh, thousands years ago, or hundreds years ago. Um, and basically, it enabled interactions uh, among the unknown people to, uh, to <coughs> pave the way for this new revolution uh, in, the, in the economy. So at least this was kind of the, 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 the theory what, what should be done. And the general definition of the sharing economy is that the consumer is granting each other temporary access to underutilized physical assets, which are kind of the idle capacity, possibly for money. 
And the important thing <coughs> here is now we see that there is, you know, there is this distinction between producers and consumers is blurred in the sense that kind of, you know, everybody is producing value and everybody is consuming uh, value. So there is kind of a way of exchanging value uh, in this, in this uh, process. And this is, of course, enabled uh, mainly by uh, near zero cost. <coughs> which means that in order to produce a new unit of a, of a product or to offer your services, your marginal cost is uh, comparatively nearing uh, zero. Of course, fixed costs are fixed costs, which we can affect by, by this. Um, and then there are different uh, facets of, of sharing economy, such as on demand, <coughs> and trend, etc. Uh, and I think this is the, the, now the, the key point about the sharing economy is it sounds really cool, right? It, it promises a lot. It, it, it is something that we all like using, but why does it fail in practice? What's the problem with it? And the answer is, in my opinion, is that basically there is a kind of a mismatch between the model, what the model promises, and how it's implemented. And the model is basically inherently decentralized. It's, there is no centralized trust. If I trust Shaka, for example, or Frank, that's fine. I don't need to trust, you know, some third-party authority. And what's uh, what's being done today is basically that the, the trust is centralized in one place, such as one company, and the rest is done, the, the, the exchange of value is done among the individuals, which is the problem. And now the, uh, the rest of my talk, I will try to answer this question, basically how to, how to fix it. And there are a couple of uh, hints uh, here, but uh, yeah, we, can, we can dig now a little bit deeper into this. And um, so I like this quote uh, very much because it really is from the Jean Jacobs. Uh, and it, it really puts um, people in the perspective. So it says, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody. So something for everybody. Only because and only when they are created by everybody. So it's, it's, it's an interesting aspect, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's really putting human in the perspective and in the focus of the important things. Uh, so uh, how are we tackling this problem? So basically, to, in order to try to, to address this issue of the sharing economy, Prevent is building a smart city platform uh, that will enable a paradigm shift from value exploitation to community value co-creation. Uh, and how we are uh, addressing this problem is basically by addressing the core issue of the problem and trying to remove the centralized authority from the picture and basically replace it with implicit decentralized trust mechanisms which are inherent to the blockchain or distributed uh, ledger technologies. Uh, so just to the, the brief overview of the conceptual overview of the platform is um, to, to, to give you that. Uh, basically the value centers or the main concept of the of of this uh, platform is in the value contracts. And value contracts are kind of uh, similar to, to, or they're kind of derived from the idea of smart contracts, which are now existing on the blockchain for several years. I'm oh, sorry. And um, basically, the value contracts enables two parties to, um, to create an agreement how they will uh, either co create the value, so in, in terms, uh, we agree that I will provide some input, some other person will provide another input, and then there will be some kind of reward as an output from this uh, value contract. And the most important thing here is, again, that there is no centralized party that needs to guarantee the, the execution and the fulfillment of this contract, but rather it is implicitly done by algorithms. So we don't need to trust each other. We don't even to like each other, you know. If we have a common interest, we can simply do that uh, together. So um, I like to say that the value enables direct and unconstrained. So really, it's completely up to you as long as it's it's uh, it's within the kind of physical within the limits of the possibilities of the physical realm. Uh, so uh, unconstrained uh, co-creation and trading in value. And similarly, we discussed a little bit about the co-creation, how we can join together to, to 
be value, but it's also very, it should be very easy to imagine how we can trade the value. So basically, it means that if I have something which is of value to Frank, for example, and Frank has something which is of value to me, we can simply create a simple contract where we exchange things. And the very nice thing about this is that the value is subjective. So for example, if I offer some kind of service and Frank thinks it's a really cool service, and somebody else thinks, it's, well, I don't really need it. You know, I cannot really put a uniform price on this. I really need to be able to negotiate this on the fly and basically to, to kind of, you know, embody this with, the, with, the, with these uh, value contracts. Yeah, we'll probably shoot through the time. So just a couple of examples about the possibilities that, uh, or uh, so possible use cases that can be built on top of this platform, which is really kind of a platform for facilitating different things. And in this case, uh, we have like, uh, uh, I think the first one is probably uh, an interesting one, which is the tracking the private funding. So uh, we talked about sucking out the value and then bringing back bits and pieces. And the, the, the things which trouble me the most is if you have, a, let's say, a local restaurant in, in, in Vienna, for example, in Austria, and you want to advertise your restaurant to the local community, you will actually go to Google and then use Google Ads or whatever to uh, you know have a targeted location base, blah blah blah, ad servicing, and this whole process is literally just taking out the value from this community, giving it back to back to California, and then Google serves the ads. And with this thing, we can easily think of different ways how we can do local socially responsible brand awareness uh, project. Such as if I have my restaurant, I really want to reach you guys. I don't want to reach you know, uh, anybody else and I don't need Google to, to, to help me to reach my neighbors essentially. So yeah, and there are many more examples but uh, I'm just going to skip them now for the sake of time since I ramble a lot. Uh, so uh, quickly, the architecture of the B-value, it's basically a decentralized computing platform. Not completely. It has the client-side application and it has a, a hybrid uh, backend. So hybrid in this case means that it's partly centralized and partly decentralized. And the centralized part you see down there, so here, and the decentralized part you see here in uh, pink. Uh, and then the client part is obviously uh, above, uh, on the top side. Um, and the whole idea is to basically have this, this decentralized or so-called trustless computation uh, replacing the centralized uh, authority. And the most important features uh, of this uh, platform are the matching and coordination algorithms. The, so basically how do we perform the negotiation in an automatic way between both parties. The value contracts which kind of embody this in a kind of a legal form, let's say, or not really legal, but a trustless form. Uh, and then we have the proof of value cre uh, creation which boils down to uh, we all need to you know, provide some additional value in order to fulfill the contract. Uh, so uh, now the, some of the challenges, uh, and there are many to do to, uh, to, to this, but uh, so, so some of the most important ones are these three, and basically it's the automatic uh, generation of value contracts, so how we uh, automatically combine the, uh, and create the contracts out of user inputs. The second one is actually uh, inherent to the it's a scalability, and this is basically with the first and second generation of blockchain or this ledger technology. It's, it's, it's a problem since, for example, Ethereum can support only 15 transactions per second, which is far below, far below the limit if you want to support the smart city. And I think the most important and definitely the most difficult one is the proof of generation of uh, value creation in these value contracts. And this, this is for a simple reason, because blockchain works perfectly well if we are all in the digital world. But if we want to connect the physical world or something happening in the physical world with the blockchain, then we are running into the problem. And in this case, the value creation essentially needs to happen in the physical world, obviously. There are some use cases where we want to, where we can have to, uh, things also happen in the digital world, but most of the things are happening in the, in the physical world. And now, if I haven't confused you enough, uh, now I'm going to talk about Byzantine generals, Maxwell demons, and possibilities. So, hoping really to confuse you now and to make this really simple. Uh, so, uh, just briefly about the consensus in distributed uh, systems. So, the consensus problem is a paradigm uh, of a wider family of agreement problems. And in short, it means that 
all the part is work in the district. This is all the processes need to agree on a specific value. So in the simplest case, on a specific value, we can have another thing like atomic uh, comments, so we can have the group memberships, for example. But the simplest case would be, is it one or is it zero? And uh, we have uh, things from uh, two RV problems, which probably most of us heard about, to Byzantine generals. And the interesting thing about this is that it really depends on what kind of the model we are talking about when we are analyzing the consensus in distributed systems. So three most important parts are the timing model, which can be a synchronous, a synchronous versus a synchronous. And synchronous means that everything is known. So if I start a process and I give it a task, I know exactly how long it will take for this process to finish. If I deliver a message, I know exactly how long it will take uh, to deliver the message. If the time is passed, I know that the message has not been delivered. So a reliable system. A synchronous is kind of, I heard this from David Romana, live in la vida loca, yes, that's how he describes it. Basically nothing is known. You just kind of shoot things here and there and everything happens uh, on its own. Uh, then the inter-process communication model, we have a shared memory message passing. I don't really think we need to talk about this. We all use message passing these days. Then we have failure models, uh, and this is kind of a wider scale. It's not one or another, but it's kind of a scale. But on the kind of one side, we have the crash stop, which means basically the process just dies. And then we have a Byzantine failure, which means the process is evil. So it not just stops, but it starts you know, becoming acting. Uh, <coughs> And uh, most of the work to, to solve the consensus problems was uh, basically done, uh, was focusing on uh, designing a master consensus algorithm. And this is the start in the 80s with Lamport you know, and other smart people. And there were quite a few algorithms developed. And I think the most important two are Texas. And this is a really cool paper, and I think everybody should uh, read this uh, in, uh, distributed systems. This is from Lamport. And then we have a recent, I think in a couple of years ago, <coughs> a lighter version of Paxos, basically, which is easier to, to implement than, uh, and it's called uh, uh, Raft. Okay, and then in 1985, there were these three people, uh, Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson, which came up with this uh, FLP possibility. And this is really another paper that I think everybody and what they've proven is that the consensus problem uh, involving a synchronous system of processes, some of, which may, some of which may be unreliable, cannot agree even on a single binary value, even if only one process is faulty. So they took a very uh, kind of conservative set of assumptions and showed that there is no con consensus 11 or 2 units. Uh, no, no, no. Give me at least five to seven. <laughs> yeah, just to, to uh, okay, I'll go briefly. I'll go briefly with this. Uh, so basically, what they've proven is that uh, you can either have safety, life, so two of these three important bits. And the bottom line is that they uh, essentially shown that the master algorithm is an impossibility. Okay, so now, uh, what does it mean to have a high consensus? High consensus is a total order. And a total order implies low entropy. And if you don't believe me, the second law of thermodynamics states that the entropy of the total system always tends to increase, meaning that all the systems are tending to become more chaotic and chaotic over time. And there is this nice thought experiment by Maxwell, uh, which is called Maxwell's Demon. And basically, Maxwell's Demon is kind of this master, you know, great intelligent creature that is able to split the, cold, the, the high energy and low energy particles on the fly. And after some time, you could have a container which would have split basically high and low energy, which in effect would enable you to produce some work, which then implies that you would have created energy out of nowhere. And we all know that it's not possible because we have to conserve energy, another thing that physics taught us. And basically an interesting observation is that the master algorithm in ICT is essentially the Maxwell demon in the physics. And none of these things are possible. Um, and now, um, why did I say I'm going to talk about proof of work and I'm introducing Maxwell demons and entropy? It kind of sounds crazy. Uh, I want to actually talk about proof of work. Since I don't have too much time, I will skip introduction how the proof of work works. I hope most of you are familiar with this. It basically boils down to solving, how, just running uh, SHA-256, like the same times, basically, to, to, to guess uh, some hash function for, uh, 
for a, for a glorified link list, which is the blockchain. But the interesting thing and how this all links to the to the consensus problem and the physics uh, or the entropy is that basically why the proof of work actually works is because it, it is dumping the extra entropy by doing work. So by doing this expensive computation, a lot of work is getting done and we are literally sucking out energy on the one side in order to introduce energy on the other side in order to uh, lower the entropy and basically achieve a distributed process. I think this is an interesting time as well because Bitcoin, as we know, is wasting a lot of electrical energy in this case as well. Uh, anyway, uh, so just kind of um, quickly about the solutions. We have several phases how to, in our, uh, now coming back to the platform again, how we can create the, the, uh, the value contracts. Uh, basically, the first one is this matching phase, which we've already briefly discussed, and which is shown in red on the diagram on the right hand side. Uh, and basically this here, the responsibility is somebody submits the task or submits some kind of input and then this matching algorithm <coughs> to find, the, to basically guarantee negotiation between different actors in the system and to match corresponding parties that are willing or able to work together. Then we have a task acceptance phase and execution phase and this is shown in the blue, uh, so here in the blue part. And the task of acceptance phase is basically that, okay, we still need to give some control to the people. It essentially means once the contract is created, uh, a person needs to really manually confirm, okay, this is, I'm in on this contract, basically. And then we have the execution phase, which is, um, which boils down to recording the value contract permanently on the blockchain. And we all know that uh, these kind of smart contracts or value contracts are essentially an application in the case of is are doing different applications, so quite powerful things. They can do, yeah, all computation known to them so far. Uh, and uh, basically, up from this point, they live uh, kind of autonomously on the blockchain uh, without any interaction with the platform, and they only interact with the actors, such as people providing the value, creating the value, or taking out some rewards, so which are basically then dynamically distributed by the value contract, as it would be in any traditional contract. And uh, the other part which I mentioned as a main challenge was the how do we actually create this proof of value creation? And this is very challenging, and we haven't, uh, we've been working on this, but we haven't uh, completely, I would say, solved the problems. So I'll just discuss three key ingredients, how to do this. First one is the off-chain oracles. And basically, oracles are, um, oracles are uh, providers of computation, which is, the trusted environment, but it's not happening on the blockchain because blockchain cannot take it. And in this case, you could imagine employing some, let's say, you have a customer support call, and you could employ some AI machine learning to do the center <coughs> of the call in order to deduce whether the customer was satisfied with the call or, uh, you know, to, to kind of try to prove that the, 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 the service provided by the service desk was actually satisfactory for the customer. Um, Another thing is the side uh, chain settlements and the, one of the probably most powerful mechanisms, or one which I think is the most promising, is the idea of lightning networks, which are which have been introduced to blockchain. And it boils down to basically, okay, we record starting the uh, transaction, starting of the transaction on the blockchain, and then we do multiple transaction transactions after that of the chain. And then in the end, once we are done, we kind of close the book and then record it back uh, again on the on the on the uh, blockchain. And I think this is very important because this is one of the things that can also assist with uh, with uh, scalability. Uh, and then, of course, there are different consensus mechanisms such as proof of work, proof of service, etc., that can be employed uh, to uh, realize the whole idea of value uh, co-creation. I'm sorry if I'm running over time. I think yes. it's, it's yeah. now. Yeah, or out of time. Stop. Stop. Because I have a summary now, and this is great. Yeah, it's just great. A <laughs> and everybody is getting a bit. Uh, I thought it's 10:30, and I was 10:31 on my watch. 
so basically, I want to conclude by saying that the smart cities are not just a playground for big players. They offer much more, and there is much more to this whole hype or whatever. Uh, and also, I think the sharing economy has a great potential, but if we really want to exploit it, we really need to attract this time, as opposed to how it's done today. And the second thing is that uh, now a little bit uh, about the, the platform itself is that we need to remove the centralized, centralized authority and create a trustless environment. And for this, the B-Value platform provides these value contra contracts which guarantee exactly this. And basically we need to enable an ecosystem for value co-creation and value exchange and by having this managed life cycle of value contracts and having the proof of value uh, co-creation, we can achieve uh, the, the second part. And uh, lastly, this is a more general observation that the distributed ledger technologies are definitely one of the key enablers of the smart city uh, infrastructure. As I said, the technology is really should be put on the infrastructure level and not uh, on the, let's say, application level as one of the first class citizens of, of smart cities. But of course, there is a number of challenges that need to be solved in order to um, achieve this vision. And I can present you some, some ideas how to solve them, but there is still a long, long, long way to go. Thank you so much, and I'm really sorry. Okay, to let's the thank the speaker. Do we have one important question? Uh, yes. Who play, pays for the platform and for the computation of the blockchain in this case and what makes you sure that if you're really successful, successful you know it will be Google for something in 10 years? Because there is a platform already still set for uh, you uh, put some of the, without your platform you don't get a value contract, right? And so you have a centralized platform. No, not really. Because the centralized part is the part. Uh, today, uh, you know, if you want to raise a lot of money, you just slap it decentralized on your project and you put, it, you put everything on the blockchain, and this is how people tend to get money, basically, with wildlife skills and whatever is happening, you know, uh, these days. But the point is that not everything needs to be centralized. So, for example, if you have a user manager, simple login, right? This doesn't need to be decentralized. This can be perfectly fine. Uh, also in the centralized uh, um, in the centralized setup, but the important thing is to uh, outsource or to create this decentralized part uh, for the things which inherently require implicit trust or which need to be executed in a trustless manner. Uh, so uh, there is really no centralization of power in this case. The platform is only helping to facilitate the most important things. But once the contract is created and it's put on the blockchain, it is completely autonomic. You cannot, you know, there is no way to change it. Like but you have the knowledge and the data of the contract. And that's the value. Okay, I see. And so uh, whether the blockchain is, uh, is uh, driven by Google or in some distributed system or something like that, uh, uh, makes no difference. You have, at the beginning with the platform, you have the data and then that's the value. And yeah, they data is, data is really well. Yeah, that's that's a fair point. But data is not the value. The information is the value, right? Yeah. And if you can extract some useful information from the data that you are given, then you can create value, and then you can potentially be able to claim you that you're not evil, for example. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but in this case, uh, the the point is that uh, although you uh, you uh, need to have a, well, first of all, let me tell you, this is a current implementation of the problem. Uh, and I believe still firmly that some parts really need to be centralized, some need to be decentralized. So not everything needs to or must be decentralized. And also the blockchain itself does, there are certain uh, projects such as uh, Monero, for example, or Zcash, which you know, provide a fair bit of uh, anonymity. But uh, still on the Bitcoin, for example, there is no real anonymity, right? You can still track the, the transaction and when the money, money exits, we will find this thing. So uh, I think this is not only a problem, so kind of coming back to your question now, this is not only an issue of the platform itself, it's kind of an issue of the technology. And the technology is progressing fast. And I believe, so two things are important in order to create a completely, uh, uh, completely decentralized system, which will guarantee you complete <coughs> trust and anonymity. 
and thus remove, reducing the removing the problem of kind of Cambridge Analytica, right? First one is you need to be completely scalable because you need to be able to support all of these things. And the reason why we are opting out for this kind of hybrid approach at the moment is because into the blockchain cannot resources are not there to support everything. And there are a lot of projects that, such as IOTA and different third generation uh, blockchain projects which are often offering or claiming at least to be able to reach up to 10,000 transactions per second. So this is one part of the solution. And the other part of the solution is basically doing the um, uh, so clear, guaranteeing full anonymity uh, and um, in the whole system. And there are, again, the solutions to these problems such as Bulletproof, CK, Snarks, and the projects which implement this such as Zcash and Monero. And I think this is kind of moving hand in hand with the with technology uh, and we kind of are using... Uh, yes, to that, uh, We are using... Um, yeah, well, I need to answer the questions. <laughs> I don't wrap up, yeah. Okay. I, 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 I hate to interrupt. This is a summer school or all relaxed, so it's, it's very busy. Yeah, but coffee, uh, coffee time is waiting. Is, is it going to be a quick one, very quick one? I, I tried because it was a bit of very broad issues. And so but I, had, uh, I found the concept of value contracts very interesting. Um, but for my impression, the logic of your presentation was a bit faulty. Because um, when I see value contracts over many areas, um, then this, what you are proposing in a certain sense, is a kind of super version of Uber, eBay, um, Airbnb, etc. Um, because um, you have smart contracts over 10, 15, 20 different business areas. But you started with saying more or less, Uber, Airbnb is not so good for the cities. Um, when you have success with that, for the city, whether um, the apartments are leased by Uber or through a centralized authority or through a decentralized version, for the city it doesn't matter. So in a certain sense, um, I, I, I see this is a, the idea, but um, in what way is it better to do it with smart contracts against um, doing it by a centralized authority by Google? Can you give a quick answer and then take it offline? <laughs> 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 or we can discuss it? It's shorter than the question, but I'll give a very quick answer. Yes, because there is yes. no centralized, uh, centralized <laughs> authority and it is replaced by implicit trust. Basically, the decisions are made by all of us instead of a central authority. I this, is a, so this, is, this is the quick answer. We can talk about this after. Yeah, the okay. 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 Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take you back at the 11.